Bengaluru, the IT capital of India, is one of the fastest growing cities. Each year, it draws lakhs of people from around India who come here to build their careers. The city is home to some of India's largest tech companies. But behind the glitzy offices and swanky housing complexes lies another story, one of neglect and destruction of the city's heritage. Founded by a local chieftain named Kempe Gowda in the 16th century, Bangalore and its surrounding area were famous for its many lakes. Till as late as the 1990s, this was also known as the Garden City of India. But the last two decades have seen a great change in the city. Exponential growth, ballooning real estate prices and endless expansion has led to great environmental challenges and damage to Bengaluru's heritage. Old buildings have disappeared and its once famous lakes today make news for the wrong reasons. We spoke to Meera Ayer, the co-coordinator of Bengaluru Intac, to understand the problems facing Bengaluru's heritage. For one thing, we don't have any regulatory framework to protect heritage. By that I mean that um, uh, although we have um, zonal regulations under the Karnataka Town and Country Planning Act, we don't have a mechanism by which these are implemented. So currently we do not have guidelines for heritage buildings, we do not have an approved heritage list, we don't have any such mechanism which the government has implemented for us to actually say this is a heritage building, this is how it should be treated, this should not be demolished, if you need modifications approach so and so. We don't have any such thing. So as in fact we have been trying to get this uh, in place and we're hopeful that it will happen soon. So this is definitely one of the big problems. The second problem is I think something that faces a lot of cities but perhaps more so in Bangalore, um, the real estate pressure, right? So the value of land trumps everything else and so that's a bit of an issue, especially when we don't have any government support to uh, in a sense counter this. Um, so this is one. Uh, and a third maybe that um, I feel like we are not celebrating whatever heritage we have enough, you know, so as a result of which there's a little bit of a disconnect between people and heritage and this is something that as in tech, we're, uh, that is one of our focus areas because we'd like people to actually build an emotional connect with their city through heritage. One of the reasons why there is a lack of awareness about heritage is a stereotype that Bengaluru is a high-tech city which lacks any substantial heritage buildings in contrast to cities like Hyderabad and Delhi. But the fact is, the city has layers and layers of heritage hidden within it. Take for instance, echoes from its earliest past, megaliths and menhirs dating back a thousand years which are under threat right now. We are a high-tech city, but I think a city is not a uh, homogenized kind of thing, right? Just like people, we have uh, multitudes within us, all of us, right? And just like that, a city also has multitudes. Unfortunately, in the case of Bangalore, only one part of it gets recognized and talked about, which is the IT city, the pub city. But we have other sides of the city as well, including our heritage. So it's a fallacy to think that Bangalore is a new city, because we're not. We've been around a very long time. And we have tangible heritage to prove it, right? Some of my favorite um, things to talk about when we speak about tangible heritage in Bangalore, built heritage, are the megaliths. So these are, um, these are structures between 2,000 and 3,000 years old and there are three, four places where you can still find these structures which are essentially funerary monuments. But it always gives me goosebumps to think that we're living in a city where on the one hand we have, uh, you know, Microsoft and all these IT things and we also have at the same time something built by people two to three thousand years ago. That's just amazing to me. So yes, we do have these megaliths in a lot of places around the city. And that just goes to show that, you know, the area has been settled for at least that long. There are megaliths, megalithic sites which were protected by the Archaeological Survey of India. And uh, at least one of them, there is no trace of at all. Uh, this is a place called Chikajala, which was on the way to the Devanahalli airport. And there's absolutely nothing left there now. That's really sad. 
um, but we have another place called Managondanahalli, which is again a uh, site protected by the Archaeological Survey of India. And there again, it's a little sad because, uh, uh, you know, it was a site with menhirs and all. Um, and uh, a lot of these megalithic monuments are being destroyed by people who think, uh, who have this wrong impression that they're going to find gold. So it would be good if more people got, uh, got to know about them, got to visit them. Uh, and I think then things would take, you know, their own course. So there are other megaliths, for example, um, in a place called Kannur, which is uh, towards the north, northern part of Bangalore. And uh, there, are, there some have been destroyed, um, have been lost to road widening. There are schools which are built over the megaliths. And there are still some which you can see in the middle of uh, uh, fields belonging to private people. So there again, it would be good if at least these are recorded, if uh, again, people know why they are important which this is something that we have been trying to do as intact, but obviously there's a lot more that, that needs to be done. We also have a lot of other um, monuments and uh, structures which date back from uh, um, early medieval as well. So for example, uh, we have a lot of inscriptions uh, written on stones and these are found all around the city. There are hero stones sometimes which don't have inscriptions, but which record the death of a hero in a battle or in a raid and so on. So these tell us a lot of uh, um, things about the social structure of the city, about the people, how they lived, what they wore, and uh, there are also inscriptions which sometimes uh, also give us details about a temple that was built, again some hero that died, and through these we've been able to build, historians have been able to build like a clearer picture of the city's settlements, how it was peopled and how it grew. We have inscriptions dating back to at least 750 AD all around the city. The other thing that's exciting about these is that these are in various languages. So you have Kannada inscriptions, uh, you have Tamil inscriptions, Telugu, uh, Persian, everything is represented. Just like the city, it's very, very multicultural, you know. It's a fallacy to think that Bangalore is a new city with no past. It's not. We have a very deep and interesting and diverse past. One name which is closely associated with Bengaluru is that of Kempe Gowda a 16th century chieftain under the suzerainty of the Vijayanagara Empire. He founded the city in 1537 when he shifted his capital here from Yelahanka. To turn it into a thriving city, Kempe Gowda established marketplaces known as Pethes and gave incentives to people to settle here. Over the centuries, Bengaluru evolved into an important trading settlement. While the Kempe Gowda fort no longer survives, there are several historic remnants of his rule scattered across Bengaluru, which are under great threat. So we have the Kempikoda airport and we have uh, medical institutions and all kinds of things named after Kempikoda with good reason because he's considered the founder of the city. Um, unfortunately, we're not treating his tangible legacy very well, is what I would say. So, for example, if you go to a place called Gavipuram, there is uh, the Kempambudi Kere, uh, by Kere I mean a lake, so it's a man-made lake, just like all the other lakes in Bangalore are man-made lakes. So on the banks of the Kempam Kempambudi Kere, there are these two sluice gates, very, very interesting uh, structures. They, are, um, they date back to probably four to five hundred uh, years ago. And uh, today, this, because the lake has shrunk, they're no longer within the lake body, they're sort of um, in the middle of land. But even so, it's really in interesting that they still survive fairly intact because they tell us about how these, these lakes served the people, that they were used, you know, how did they manage the water. There were these irrigation channels that were built. The water was regulated using these sluice gates. So these are all, again, things that we learn when we see these sluice gates. Today, unfortunately, um, um, very often, you cannot even approach those gates because it's completely filled up with garbage or there's vegetation all around. So yes, we're not treating, we're treating it in a very cavalier manner, his uh, legacy. So a lot of people know about, almost every Bangalorean will know about the Kempegada Towers and uh, we think there are four of them. In fact, there are more. So the four of them, for example, there's one in Gavipuram, there's one in Lalbagh, there's one in Ramana Maharishi Park and there's one in Alsur. But in Gavipuram itself, there's one which is celebrated, it's protected, you have a sign and everything and just, you know, maybe like, 300 meters away, there's another one, which is from the same period, which is difficult to access, which needs conservation, which is kind of, you know, uh, 
uh, falling apart and nobody knows about it. So why is that? You know, we need to actually restore that. We need to celebrate that just as well as we are celebrating the other ones. Bengaluru is also home to several forts around the city. Dating from the 16th to the 18th centuries, these were originally military fortifications which have now become part of the fast expanding city. Most of these forts are in need of maintenance. How many cities can you think of in India which have not just one, not just two, but so many forts, right? There's the old fort uh, in the Pete area. Admittedly, no longer exists, but the footprint is still there. You can see exactly how the fort, which was built by Kempegoda, what it looked like. The walls are gone, but the city inside is intact. South of that, we had the Bangalore fort, which dates from about the 1600s and 1700s. And there, we still have a small, teeny tiny remnant of that, also really, really important, protected by the archaeological survey. In addition, we have Begur Fort, right? Begur Fort is another very unique construction. It's a circular fort in mud. One of the few mud forts that we still have in this region. And um, on the gateway to that uh, Begur Fort, there are actually these two inscriptions which are ancient. They uh, date back to around the 9th century AD. This is like an incredibly um, unique fort for its architecture, but also for its... Uh, um, its typology, its, its um, historical importance. We do not really know how old it is because we cannot assume that the structure dates from the same time as the gateways there because it's possible, you know, the stones were used from elsewhere. Uh, if you look at the structure itself, it does not seem to date from the 9th century. It's probably much later, yet it is still a very, very interesting structure. One of the issues that Bengaluru's heritage buildings face is that there is no single list of heritage monuments in the city. This is because, as per the law, the Bangalore Urban Arts Commission was designated to be the main heritage authority in the city. But the commission was wound up in 2001 and has not been reconstituted since then. We don't actually have an approved list um, except for the ones which are protected by the ASI and the State Department of Archaeology. So the ASI monuments um, in the city would be the, you know, the Tipu Sultan's Palace, the Bangalore Fort, and if you go a little further afield, Devanahalli Fort, and um, there's a small little palace in Nandi Hills. So these are the, the ASI protected monuments. There are about seven or eight monuments within the city which are protected by the State Department of Archaeology. So the Kempakoda Forts, for example. Uh, there's um, an inscription in Maleshwaram, which is a uh, state protected monument. There is Begur Temple. Um, apart from that, everything else that you see uh, in the city, all our heritage is unprotected. Um, it is not listed as yet. So a few years ago, uh, 2017 I think, there was actually a, what is called a revised master plan prepared for the city. Um, and uh, this, a draft of the revised master plan, which uh, actually included for the first time a list of monuments uh, around the city. Uh, a list of buildings around the city which are to be considered heritage, which should be notified by the city. So this list had um, around 500 odd structures with, within it. Um, and out of these, I would say um, 150, 170 or so would have been government and institutional buildings. Everything else is private. So the city does have a lot of properties which are residential. Uh, heritage in Bangalore is not in your face. We are not a monumental city. We are a, a city of like multiple historic centers and we're a city where everyday heritage, like living heritage is really much more common. By that I mean our heritage is not ossified. It's not in a museum. It's not like something you just go see and visit and come back. We're living in it. We have houses, we have offices, we have schools, we have temples. All of these are still living, breathing, everyday heritage. This we have plenty of, right? And the problems with these are because many of them are in private hands, things become a little sticky. It's not that easy dealing with private heritage, right? Protecting it. Uh, in 2020, April 2020, we had what are called the zonal regulations that were notified in the Gazette, right? And these talk about, um, these are essentially heritage regulations which talk about what a heritage conservation committee should do. So they specify that for every district in Karnataka, there should be a heritage conservation committee. Um, and there's a little clause there which says that for Bangalore, it is the Bangalore Urban Art Commission which will function as the heritage conservation committee. Unfortunately, we do not have a Bangalore Urban Art Commission. There used to be one and that was disbanded in 2001. 
So for more than 20 years we haven't had a Bangalore Urban Art Commission. So only with the setting up of, the, of this BUAC can these guidelines, these uh, regulations rather, actually be operationalized because only then can they come up with a heritage list, an approved heritage list and then decide, you know, for, for each monument, guidelines to be prepared and then all, all the rest of it has to happen. So that has not happened yet. But there have been successes in preservation of heritage through citizen-led initiatives such as the recently restored Dodda Jella Railway Station and the Fort High School. The citizen group are actively raising their voices for heritage. The other very interesting thing about Bangalore is that it is um, probably one of the cities where civic activism is really, really um, alive. So, um, and I think that's where our future lies, right? As long as there are more people vocal about it, willing to come out on the streets, willing to write to their MLAs, willing to say, no, this is not right, then we're fine. There will be ups and downs. But then if people are willing to actually say, speak up for it, then it's fine. So uh, some years ago, some this is probably already like eight years ago, there was a movement, there was a, a move to demolish one of the very well-beloved uh, bungalows in the city, which was a government property. And there was a whole movement that built up around it, you know. People literally came out on the streets and then that demolition was stopped. So this kind of thing, I think, um, it's, these are wonderful signs of hope. Another part of Bengaluru's heritage, which is under a threat, are its great lakes and tanks, which have been an intrinsic part of the local ecology for over a thousand years. We spoke to Vishwana S from the Biome Environmental Trust, an NGO which has been working to conserve the lakes of Bengaluru. Mr. Vishwanathan explains the ecological importance of these lakes and the threats that they face with the pressure of urbanization. Historically, uh, geology speaking, geologically speaking, this area is more than three and a half thousand million years old. The rocks at Lalbagh tell us about a history which is spanning before the dinosaurs. The rocks also tell us that the uplift in this part of the continent has brought this place which we call Bangalore now to 920 meters above sea level, which means this is at the highest point in the surrounding areas. This also means that there is no perennial river in this place. There are only ephemeral streams which flow during the rainy seasons, usually August, September, October and November. So the ancient people who occupied this land to make sure that they had water essentially for cultivation but also for drinking, built what are called tanks. These are man-made lakes built by throwing an earthen berm or an earthen dam across a valley and holding on to the waters of the monsoon to make it last over the rest of the months. The lakes were primarily designed for irrigating what is called the achkat or the command area below it. Rice was a popular uh, cultivation as were millets. The lakes recharged the groundwater and through what are called open wells, the water was drawn for drinking purpose. Lakes allowed this land to be inhabited, to be cultivated. When they were built, they were built for a very minuscule population, population of villages. In the 1870s, there was three consecutive years of drought in Bangalore. And the famous thousand lakes of Bangalore were not sufficient to provide drinking water. There was drought followed by famine. A lakh people died in the old Mysore kingdom. At that point of time, the city rulers decided that they needed a permanent solution to the drinking water needs of a fast growing city. Remember, the population was about one and a half lakhs at that time. And so the city of owners or rulers built a reservoir called Hesargatta on the Arkavati River, about 20 kilometers away from the current city center, and started to pump water to the city. So in 1896, water started to flow into the city from pipes. At that point of time, the role of lakes as providers of drinking water started to diminish and the importance of these lakes and uh, tanks started to diminish. In the 1960s, this was followed by bouts of malaria. Malaria entered India in, uh, at a large scale and started affecting the populace. So at that point of time, the then malaria committee formed by the city said that these tanks or lakes had started to collect wastewater and therefore had become sources of mosquito breeding and wanted them to be closed. So a second blow came in the 1960s. 
In the 1980s and 1990s, when the IT boom and the real estate boom started in the city, at that point of time, the real estate prices started to go up and therefore lakes had now to compete with uh, land prices. So lakes, which were no longer needed for drinking water purpose, started to be filled with construction debris, leveled up with land and converted to sites and layouts. The state itself converted a lot of tanks into bus stands, railway stations, stadiums and so on and so forth. And private parties encroached upon lakes and built layouts and apartments and buildings there. The threats of a fast growing city, of a large population of high real estate prices and unmanaged solid waste and construction debris resulted in the final blow to the lakes. The last insult to injury is coming when sewage or untreated sewage is flowing into water the remaining lakes of Bangalore. And now the challenge is how do you deal with protecting the lakes from encroachment, but also how do you protect lakes from sewage influ influx into it. In the last two decades, a large number of lakes have simply disappeared, turned into office complexes and housing colonies. But there have also been success stories of how water bodies can successfully be conserved with private-public partnerships. Jakkur Lake is one of the oldest lakes in the city. Its history dates to 1342 AD. This was a lake in the periphery of the city and as the city moved in toward, towards the lake, it started to see the usual construction debris dumping, biomedical waste dumping and solid waste dumping. But community uh, came together and decided to protect the lake, took it up with the institution, made sure that the sewage treatment plant, which was adjacent to the lake, started to function well and supply the lake with treated wastewater, made sure that a constructed wetland was designed to intermediate the sewage water, to polish it further, to clean it further and make sure that the lake is full. And in partnership with the fishermen who were taking care of the lake because of the fishes there, started to maintain and clean up the lake. In cooperation with political authorities and government institutions, the lake has now become a model for what's called integrated urban water management. It receives treated wastewater and it is always full throughout the year. It provides livelihoods for fishers, but also grass cutters who are allowed to take the grass to feed their cattle. It is looked after by the state very well. And it's now a model to be replicated, not only in Bangalore, but all across India as part of the integrated urban water management. Dodbamasandra Lake, which is adjacent to Jakkur, followed the Jakkur model. The BEL, which is a public sector unit, decided to invest about 13 and a half crores as CSR funds, corporate social responsibility funds, and built a 10 million liter per day wastewater treatment plant. The BEL runs this plant, takes 2 million liters for its own requirement, and provides 8 million liters to the lake to, for it to be full. Again, cattle herders earn a livelihood from this lake. This lake now has some waters and is now on, under the process of refurbishment for it to receive more and more of the treated wastewaters. Once this lake is full, it recharges the groundwater in a surrounding area of up to four kilometers and all open wells and bore wells in the surrounding area now have come back to life, providing water for the residents. So the lake has a common pool resource, the lake has a corporate responsibility and the lake has a beneficiary for citizens surrounding it. All of these have been realized both in Jakkur and in Dodabamasandra. From these two case studies, there is a very specific set of learnings which can be replicated for other lakes across the city of Bengaluru. There are crucial lessons involve the community surrounding the lake because they are key stakeholders who protect it and take care of the lake's interest. Create community organizations, plan along with them as to what we mean by rehabilitation of a lake. Ensure that livelihoods which are provided by the lake continue to be so. Don't prevent cattle grazers, grass cutters, fishers from, from the lake. They have a stake in it and they are critical stakeholders who will take care of the lake. Their livelihoods are crucially dependent on it. Design the lake to receive treated wastewater. Set up a sewage treatment plant so that untreated sewage which flows around the lake is picked up in the sewage treatment plant, is cleaned to the highest tertiary standards and then released into the lake. Design a constructed wetland as a portion of the lake where the stormwater drain and the sewage comes in so that the constructed wetland not only becomes a biodiversity spot with lots of birds, small mammals and reptiles, but also cleans a bit of the untreated wastewater which could come in, the stormwater that comes in and the treated wastewater that comes in. These wetlands become repositories of rich biodiversity and become a learning and education tool for our younger generation. Then keep the lake desilted so that it recharge the, recharges the groundwater continuously. 
make sure that the overflow ware has a siphon system so that in the case of floods, the water levels in the lake can be lowered to receive sudden surges of flood water and therefore manage flood better. Involve corporates if it's possible as part of the CSR to bring in funds to make sure that the lakes are treated well, are maintained. But make sure that the lake is a common pool resource. It should not be owned by any private party. It should continue to be state owned and with community participation as a common pool resource. Crucial lessons for us and crucial lessons which demonstrate that this can be replicated all across India. It is only through community initiatives undertaken by local residents that Bengaluru's natural heritage can be revived and saved. I am very optimistic uh, about what can happen, the potential that can happen, thanks to very active citizen uh, organization, thanks to the help given by the judiciary when citizens have taken the issue to court, thanks now to the attitude of the state which is a bit more participative, which is a bit more inclusive, and thanks also to the demonstration shown by many lakes as to what can potentially be done with these lakes, put in Ali in the north of Bangalore, put in Ali in the south of Bangalore. A constant citizen presence, a constant community mobilization has resulted in the lakes, in at least some of the lakes being saved and this list is expanding. The number of lakes that are being saved and rehabilitated is only expanding. And therefore, if we set ourselves the goal that all 210 lakes that remain in Bangalore will be rehabilitated by a certain date, let's say two years from now, it's possible for the city to achieve it with the help of the community. It's a great, great uh, learning curve for us and it's something that one has to be hopeful and optimistic about, provided the state reaches out. There are vast challenges that Bengaluru's heritage faces, but what stands out is the can-do spirit of its residents and the optimism for the future, something that makes the city stand apart. Across Bengaluru, citizen groups are joining hands to make a difference to save their heritage.